Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Bishar Anasar. I am uh, the founder and the director of the Museum of the Palestinian People based here in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome on this call. Welcome on Saturday morning, beautiful morning in, in Washington, D.C. It's warm and, and it's starting to get uh, some humid. Uh, hopefully that will, will mean that the coronavirus is, is uh, is becoming less and less in, in this difficult times. Uh, and I hope everyone is, is healthy and, and safe in these times. Uh, again, I, uh, my name is Bishara and I was born in Jerusalem. I uh, grew up in uh, Bethlehem. And I grew up in, uh, a fam in my family farm uh, just outside of Bethlehem that has been with my family since 1916, uh, back in the Ottoman, when the Ottoman Empire was occupying and colonizing Palestine and the whole Middle East and North Africa. Uh, uh, the farm has been with my family since then, and right now uh, it's under the threat of confiscation. The Israeli government wants to take it and build a settlement uh, and uh, my family has been in the Israeli courts since then. Uh, and that really inspired me uh, to educate people about uh, Palestine, about the farm, and to, to share my story more and more uh, with people. Uh, I came to the United States when I, when, uh, in 2011, and when I came to DC, I, I was really struck by all the museums and monuments and memorials, uh, seeing the African American Museum, seeing the Native American Museum, the Holocaust Museums, the Chinese, the Japanese Museums. There's so many stories that's being told in DC over and over again. And what was missing for me is really seeing the Palestinian, the Palestinian story being told. And not just through an event, but through an institution that can continually preserve and share the story, our story. Especially that being in the United States, I have experienced that the story of, of our people is minimized to a news item, to a news line, whether we are victims or poor Palestinians, or we are um, uh, violent people. And you know, the museum really shows, really create a third way, which is showing Palestinians as human beings, showing Palestinians as artists, as entrepreneurs, as real people with real stories. Uh, and uh, really using art, using culture, using uh, storytelling uh, to recreate, create, create a possibility where where really it's, it's possible that the view of the Palestinians is being transformed in the world. And not just one story, but also many stories. We have so many, so many stories, like my story is, 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 for example, what it means for me, for, for me to be Palestinian is different than what it means to be for, for Mo, who's going to be uh, leading our tour today. Uh, I grew up in, in Palestine, in Bethlehem. For example, Mo has grew up in Lebanon. He's never been to Palestine. Um, we have so many Palestinians in Chile. We have so many Palestinians in Europe and, and, and around the world. And we really want to feature all these Palestinians. And which is why our message, our core uh, value is many stories, one heart. Sharing all these Palestinian story, stories transcending borders, transcending politics, religion, racial, and invite visitors, inviting you to discover yourselves through getting to know us. Uh, just a little bit about how this, uh, this, all, this whole museum started. We started in 2015 as a traveling exhibit, uh, traveled to different community centers, colleges, universities and uh, we built the momentum to create a permanent museum in Washington DC which we opened last year Ju uh, June 15th and uh, since then we have had uh, 4,000 visitors uh, we were going very very good uh, very strong and getting a lot of uh, visitors and media attention and uh, a lot of momentum 
Uh, until, uh, you know, the coronavirus hit a couple of months ago, we had to close uh, the museum. Uh, we uh, lost, uh, lost most of our revenues from visitors that's coming in. And in response to that, we thought like, you know, we, we can't stop. This is very important mission to share our story. So we created a virtual museum that you're about to see to take like to, to offer a, 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 an experience where as if you're at the museum yourself uh, and that virtual museum is also important because like anyone who can't visit washington dc can now go on the virtual museum and explore the museum themselves or with with a tour like you're going you're about we're about to to do today um we have done a lot of uh, artist talks. We have done a lot of virtual tours. We have done a lot of. Uh, 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 yesterday, we commemorated the Nakba with a Nakba survivor, Hassan, who shared with us about his story. We're doing all of this, uh, yet we are small operations. We were mostly based on volunteers. Uh, I'm the only full time person in the museum. And uh, we really can't do these events, free events, without your support and without your generosity, without so many people who, who's giving and who's giving, whether it's, it's uh, um, one-time donation or monthly donations through the Resilience Monthly Club that we're, we're, we're offering at the museum. And uh, we, 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 we really uh, uh, thank everyone for, for their support and uh, we, uh, we invite, if you're able to, to and if you're touched by this um, tour, to, to make a donation to support, uh, to support us to keep going in this difficult time. And uh, today we are commemorating the Nakba. Yesterday was uh, 72 years, 72 years. Uh, uh, since 1948, since the Nakba. Uh, Nakba means catastrophe in Arabic. Uh, when Palestinians were displaced, over 700,000 Palestinians were displaced from their homes and villages and lands. Uh, you will hear more about it uh, from Mo and from his personal story, being a refugee himself, uh, being uh, a descendant from uh, his family who fled uh, his, their villages, their village in Palestine. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce Mo. Uh, Mo is also a volunteer and a docent at the museum. He's been uh, volunteering with us since uh, August of last year, and he's currently uh, is a chief uh, 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 tech person at the Smithsonian Zoo in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you all for being with us, and thank you everyone for, for, for being here today. Thank you, Pshada. It's a pleasure to be here. I recognize a lot of faces, so you've probably seen me before and heard my voice, but uh, thank you again for coming. Um, so today I'm just going to talk a little bit more about my story um, um, uh, as a Palestinian, and then I'm also going to give uh, a brief virtual tour of the museum uh, with particular emphasis on our, our uh, Nakba collection. So we have a lot of, you know, the museum, we, we made the Nakba a very critical part of our history of Palestine portion. And I wanted to get into that too. So, um, so just to, to, to give you a quick background. So I'm actually half Palestinian. My mother is Lebanese, but because I was born in Lebanon, Lebanon doesn't uh, recognize matrilineal citizenship. So of course, I was born into this world as a Palestinian. There was no question that I was a Palestinian. Um, and it was an identity actually that, uh, because I, I grew up in Lebanon in the 80s, and, and then I moved to the Gulf later, would really, you know, it, it would become, it would really define my character. Because when you're a Palestinian, um, you, you automatically have a mark on you, you know? Uh, it's a polemical or a controversial piece of identity, you know? Um, and so I'm gonna go into that a little bit, so. Um, so I was born in 1981, <laughs> I, I gave away my age. Um, I was born in Beirut uh, at the American University Hospital. Both my parents uh, went to the American University of Beirut and that's where they met. 
Um, and I was born so right before the uh, Israeli inv invasion in Lebanon. Um, so times were very, very difficult. Uh, of course, I don't remember much, but the stories my mother uh, shared with me uh, were very difficult to hear uh, later on in life. But uh, um, so my mother's Lebanese. She's originally from Sur. Sur is a city in the south or Tyre. It's an ancient city. Um, she is Shia, Lebanese Shia. And her family actually has always been very active in supporting the Palestinian presence in Lebanon. So I'll go into that. Uh, my grandmother actually leased land, my Lebanese grandmother leased land for the PLO when they first came into Lebanon. Um, and, 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 and she, you know, um, her, her, her brother too was a very prominent activist um, as well. I also had an uncle who uh, actually served briefly with the Fidei Yun. This is my Lebanese family, <laughs> just my Lebanese. So they were always very fiercely pro-Palestinian. They were always looking uh, to help the Palestinians in Lebanon, um, um, which is why, you know, when my mother met my father, usually there would be a lot of conflict or tension between, you know, Palestinians marrying Lebanese and vice versa, uh, but they embraced, they embraced this union wholeheartedly. Um, <clears throat> a bit about my father. Uh, my father is uh, from Deir el Ansi originally. It was a village, uh, it's, it's a village north of Akka in, in Palestine, and it's five kilometers from, around five kilometers from the Lebanese border. Um, I've never been. My father was born there um, in 1946, and uh, either 46 or 48, and I will talk about that later. Um, but basically, uh, after the Nakba uh, in 1948, uh, the whole family stayed in the village, uh, but then they were, um, well, let me backtrack. I'll talk a little bit more about the village. So Dedel Asi, it was a very small village, you know, probably under a thousand inhabitants. It was mostly a Muslim village. Um, there were two big clans there. There was the Al Khatib clan, which is my family name. Uh, which and Al Khatib is actually a very common name. <laughs> it's actually found throughout the, the, the Arab world in Egypt and Lebanon uh, and of course in Palestine. Um, and uh, the other clan was the Maruf clan, and uh, they were actually the bigger clan <laughs> of uh, in the village, and they actually owned most of the property. Um, my grandfather was very very poor. He was uh, a subsistence farmer. He primarily uh, farmed in, 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 uh, with lemon trees and figs. So, teen ulaym Muhammad. So, and life was, you know, according to them, so I, you know, was very simple. When I would talk to my grandfather, he never really, he tried to paint a very rosy picture of Palestine. He never really tried to, I mean, uh, you know, it to, to, um, stoke my passion like he, he, he never had any ill will to, to say about uh, any ill will towards Zionism or um, uh, the Jewish inhabitants of Palestine he never said anything bad which was you know very different than to my peers you know growing up who were very angry you know especially people in my generation they were very angry uh, compared to my grandparents um, so uh, after 1948, uh, well, you know, the, just to, to paint the scene, um, the Arab Legion, they were trying to defend the village. Of course, that fell through. And um, when the, the newly formed the Palmach, they came in, uh, they sat there for a little bit and they, they didn't know what they wanted to do. So they actually, my, the whole family remained for an extra year. Uh, in 1949, before the edict came um, by the Israeli generals to depopulate the entire village. The village was, uh, the village inhabitants were forcibly marched to the Lebanese border. Um, and uh, in 1949, uh, my father was a child um, and they immediately were settled in the refugee camp of Damur. So I don't know if you're familiar with Damur. It's one of dozens of refugee camps in Lebanon. Uh, but this camp was unique because it was situated close to the Christian village of Damur. 
Um, and uh, for years it was fine. And, you know, my father growing up, he, you know, he would talk about like how he really befriended the Lebanese Christians in the village and he loved, uh, he loved Maronite, Lebanese Maronite culture. You know, my father wasn't very religious. He's, he isn't very religious, but, you know, he really loved that. But, you know, um, leading, uh, you know, in 1970, uh, as you know, there was the Talazata massacre. So uh, in in uh, in the, in Damur, um, and there were like a lot of skirmishes between uh, the village itself and the refugee camp because the PLO had taken uh, control of the refugee camp and they wanted to take control of the village as well of Damur. They saw it as a strategic asset for them. Um, and uh, but the outcome was disastrous hundreds of palestinians lost their lives in the mood and my family my father's family was forced to move again and this time they moved to Ain Hilwi, which is the largest refugee camp in lebanon uh just to paint a setting did uh damur is like a small hamlet you know if we're gonna if we're gonna uh, compare refugee camps to cities <laughs> or towns you know, Damur would have been the hamlet and Dir al Asi would have been the metropolitan city. It would have been the New York. It's the New York of, <laughs> of refugee camps. It was massive, it was sprawling. Um, and, uh, and, and, and life was difficult. Um, um, but, you know, they settled in. Um, so from 1970 on, uh, onwards, they, they settled in the family. Um, there and my father actually he was in university at the time so he never actually got to live in Dar el Asi directly um, but um, you know it would still it would it would still define our home and actually you know the it's it, what's what's interesting is that the whole village of Dar el Asi they moved to Damur together so the Maruf and the Khatibs, they all moved to the <laughs> to Damur, and then after Damur, they all moved also to Dar el Az uh, to to uh, Ain al Hilwi, and it just seems like they really they desperately wanted to cling on to the village, to to the the, the makeup of the village. They wanted to preserve the clan identities in Dar el Asid, and and actually that continues to persist today. It's, it's, it's fascinating to see all the WhatsApp groups, the Facebook pages dedicated to this village that actually no longer exists, by the way. It was completely demolished, completely lost over. It actually became a, it became an artist's colony. So yeah, when I heard about that, that really stoked my, <laughs> uh, I was not happy about that. Uh, you know, hearing that, um, but, um, you know, so they, they really wanted to, uh, to, to preserve that. Um, so a bit about my father himself. So I mentioned earlier that we don't really know his, his age. And that's because when my grandfather, when they moved into, uh, my grandmother, when they went into Lebanon and they were uh, greeted by aid workers, um, they did not want baby formula. So they lied about my father's age. At least that's the story my father tells me. <laughs> so they lied about his age so they could get proper food. Um, and this was actually a common practice. So a lot of Palestinians desperate to get more rations as they were coming into Lebanon, they would um, lie about their, kid, their, their children's ages. So, you know, babies, new, newborn babies became toddlers. And so they didn't want to get baby formula. So, um, but, um, but officially my father's, so officially my father's birth certificate says he was born in 1948 and not 1946. Um, but yeah, um, growing up in Lebanon, my father, um, he was very smart. He went to Anurwa schools. Um, he actually, uh, was able to, um, to, to, for high school, he actually was able to go to a boarding school, a Catholic boarding school um, called uh, in, in Saida. It's called the Saida American School. And he would talk about, you know, 
the commute uh, from uh, from Damur to to this camp. Uh, I mean, to the school, you know, and how he the long walks he would have to take, um, and um, you know, it, it was just he loved he loved it despite the poverty. I mean, there were seven brothers and sisters. They lived in a one bedroom shack but you know my father talked about um how the radio was so meaningful to him you know and music um things that i would so take for granted today you know were so priceless back then um not to say that life was easy was very difficult um but he really went out of my father goes out of his way to paint this rosy picture of his life, even though I know, you know, because I've been to Ayn al many times. It was not, um, you know, I mean, it's it's home, but at the same time, it's not, you know, it's not a, it's not a pleasant place. Um, today, my father is an engineer. He lives in Qatar. Um, and uh, my brother also is an engineer. Um, and a lot of Palestinians, as you know, uh, after, uh, you know, the Nakba, they tried to make names for themselves. They tried to put themselves out there. And a lot of them moved to the to the Gulf. In fact, a lot of my Palestinian family, they moved to the Arabian Gulf, to the Palis, you know, in the in the 70s, in the early 70s, in the 80s. Uh, I had an uncle, my uncle Salim. He actually moved to Abu Dhabi uh, when he was just 14 to become an apprentice, a mechanic apprentice. This was actually a very common strategy. Um, these were families who were desperate and they needed to, you know, you know, so my, my uncle, and then I had another uncle, um, uh, Bassam, and he actually was able to, um, his story is amazing. And I should mention it here. Uh, he was the youngest brother, my father's youngest brother. So, um, and his dream was to study in America, but at the time, the PLO was trying to recruit. Uh, this was, you know, in the early 80s. They were trying to recruit, forcibly recruit Palestinian youth. Um, so uh, Bassam deliberately broke his legs. So he could not, he didn't have to fight with the Fida'iyun. <laughs> and so he was able to apply. And he actually moved to Long Island, New York. And he was my first relative to move to the United States. He lives in Cleveland uh, now. Um, so, uh, so just getting to my story real quick, sorry, I mean, you know, uh, I wasn't born in Ayn al -Hilwi. I never lived in Ayn al-Hilwi, I actually lived in Beirut, um, and, uh, we lived in Beirut, me and my two brothers, uh, until, uh, just before the Gulf War, we moved to Qatar. So my father had actually already been working in Qatar for a long time. He had his own business. He was a civil engineer. Um, and so he moved us all to Qatar. Of course, the Gulf War <laughs> breaks out. <laughs> so, you know, I was, it's like fortuitous. I was born in 81. The Lebanese, uh, the Israeli invasion of Lebanon happened. And, and, and then uh, we moved to Qatar in 1990. And then the Gulf War happens. <laughs> um, but I stayed in Qatar up until 1998. And then I moved back to, I moved to Lebanon for a year. I went to the American University of Beirut. Um, and before that, uh, and, and I was there for a year when we finally got our green cards. So um, the way we got our green cards is a little complicated, but we just got it through family ties. And eventually, you know, it, it, it came down to us. But we had actually formally applied with the embassy in 1984. And so it took 14 years for us to get the green card. This represented my first citizenship anywhere so it was so um it was incredible because you know for years we had lived with this wafiqa that said we couldn't you know we were stateless we couldn't vote you know our lives are vulnerable um after the gulf war my father was summoned by the Qatari police and they threatened to deport him you know, a lot of Palestinians came under suspicion. So it was, it's scary. Being a, being a refugee is scary uh, because you're vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and so we, um, so of course I jumped at the tents. And so we moved, you know, to the States. I moved to Massachusetts in 1999. 
um, for, and then I went to school. Um, I graduated in about 2004, and that's also when I got my American citizenship. So my first citizenship to any country. So I'm technically not a refugee today. <laughs> I'm an American citizen. But yeah, so 2004 is when I got my, um, you know, uh, I moved to DC, uh, to Washington DC about 10 years ago to go to school here. Um, and I've been here ever since. And I found out about the museum last year uh, via uh, an NPR article and my partner also told me about it. And, uh, and so I, um, and I was, uh, and I'm, you know, uh, as Prada mentioned, I actually work, I work today for the Smithsonian. I'm a web developer. Um, so I build the zoo's website um, or manage the, the, the national zoo's website. So uh, it was, uh, it was really great. You know, I was just starting to get into the museum culture in DC and finding the Palestinian museum. It was just a, it was definitely the museum of the Palestinian people. Sorry. And it was definitely a natural fit for me. So I've been there ever since. Um, which hopefully will be a good segue for me to talk about the museum and our Nakba collection. So um, we really, when we first opened in June of 2019, uh, one of the biggest parts of the exhibit was the Nakba. And why did we choose to focus on the Nakba? There are so many areas in Palestinian life, especially for a museum like this, where we want to, you know, we wanted to focus on the, there's uh, the, Tatsris, there's dance, there are um, Palestinian industry, you know, there's also the Palestinian diaspora, but we do have, but, you know, we acknowledge that the Nakba is a critical component to our identity as Palestinians, um, especially living in the diaspora. It really defines who we are. Um, um, so I was just going to give you a quick tour of the museum. Um, I'm going to share my screen real quick. So hey Mo, a, a, before yes. you jump into the tour, um, I know I have yeah. one question in, in the chat, and I sure. hope, I'm hoping maybe we, if anyone has, you know, if they're chomping at the bit to ask you a question about your story, um, if sure. you can yes. get in right now before we, we transition. Um, so I'll start with Lisa's question. I, earlier um, in, your, in, your, in your talk, you mentioned um, the last name, we think, uh, Maruf, and Maruf, she said she yeah. has some friends in Ramallah with the same family name. Yeah. So, if that sparks any connections for, uh, with you? Or? <laughs> I don't, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, I don't know of, uh, of any uh, of Ma'rufs in Ramallah. I've actually never been to the Duffi. I've never been to the West Bank or Gaza for obvious reasons. Uh, but, uh, well, before 2004, it would have been obvious reason. Now I don't have an excuse. I should go. But, <laughs> but yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. The Ma'ruf family is big. I mean, the last name, even the Khatib family. Uh, Khatib actually means, for those who don't speak Arabic, it means orator, it means someone who uh, he uh, does the address in the in the in the mosque, uh, and uh, which is very naturally good last name for someone like me who really likes to talk. So, <laughs> and also it means uh, Khatib means engagement. Um, anyway, sorry. Is, are there any other questions? If anyone has any other questions? Can you just? say me in the chat and I'll unmute you so you can yeah. ask uh, directly. And if not, we'll go right to the tour. We have plenty of time for questions at the end. Mm, okay, carry on and we will... Uh, oh, uh, awesome. Yeah, Lisa just uh, said thanks for sharing your, your story. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah. Okay. There are lots of stories, but, you know, hopefully... Um, so this is our, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have already been here uh, on the call, but for those who haven't, you can actually access a link to our virtual tour um, via our website. So this is our website, it's mppdc.org, and we can post a link to, uh, to that on our website. Um, and um, the museum generally is divided into three sections. We have uh, the first, you know, one of the sections focuses on the history of Palestine, and that's where I'm really gonna focus on. Uh, which which talks about the, you know the Nakba. Um, so um, just a couple of quick things. So we have a couple of exhibits that kind of talk about life before the Nakba. Uh, we have this National Geographic article or magazine that um, with an article about village life in the Holy Land. Um, this was written in 1914, and it um, 
you know, and 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 the the emphasis um, was on on rural life in Palestine. And you can actually uh, we have a, a PDF that you can read uh, you can read through. It's a very rare artifact, and um, well, it's a relatively rare artifact. You know, to see stories like this that really focus on the Palestine, you know, the inhabitants of Palestine, um, even prior to uh, the British occupation. Um, and we also have uh, a couple of, uh, a few um, uh, photo panels of, of life in Palestine. Um, we have a, a picture, uh, an image here of a Palestinian wedding. And this is uh, in about, you know, prior in between 1900 and 1940, I think is around 1920. Um, this is a, uh, a Christian wedding, as you can see. Um, and, um, you know, we really wanted to kind of emphasize what Palestinian life was like before the Nakba. There are a lot of people, when I first came here um, and I got to know Israelis, a lot of Israelis would tell me, you know, Palestine as an identity didn't really come into fruition until after Israel was formed. And to me, that is so incredulous when I hear that because we've always defined ourselves as Palestinian. You know, I mean, yes, we're Arabs too, but it was very, it was jarring to, for me to hear that, you know. And so the museum, we kind of wanted to show that continuity, to, to repudiate that, that assessment that we were formed in reaction to another people. No, we've always been a people, we've always had our, our customs, we've always had our traditions. Um, we have uh, this, this part here, this part of the museum here is, is one of my favorite. It's basically a collection of ID cards and birth and marriage certificates. All of these were donated by one family. This is by the Saf family. And what's so great about it, it just basically catalogs their story as a family. Um, from before the Nakba and then till after the Nakba. Um, we have actually a uh, uh, passport covers from the British, from British Mandate Palestine. And this is, you know, we, uh, we also have inserts, uh, image, uh, photographs of the, of the insides of the, the internals of the, um, of the passports. And uh, these were issued to both Palestinian Arabs and Palestinian Jews. So, you know, before the creation of the state of Israel, everyone who lived in uh, under the British were referred to as Palestinians uh, and, you know, and so uh, they probably had ID cards, the identical ID cards. We also have, you know, a marriage certificate here as well. Um, this, um, this is interesting to me and I, it's probably a little difficult to see here, but uh, this marriage certificate was uh, between uh, Hanna and Nabiha, and this was, the marriage took place in 1934. They're, you know, you can note here that they're an Orthodox family, Christian Orthodox family. Um, unfortunately, this certificate was actually issued in 1964, despite the marriage taking place in 34. And the reason for this is because they, um, after the Nakba, um, this family's entire history or documents became null and void and they had to start fresh. Um, and so this birth certificate was actually issued by the Jordanian government in 1964. Um, and I can just only imagine the trouble that this family went through after 1948 to get their life sorted back in order, you know, to get, to get things back on track for them. And these, this is the common experience for most Palestinians. So um, highly, you know, when you do look through the tour, you know, we also have audio clips as well. So you're welcome to look at, you know, to listen to, to, to get more context. Um, and then finally, we have a wall here that kind of goes into the history uh, of the British mandate um, leading up to the events of the Nakba. Here we have an image of Palestinians rebelling in uh, uh, or protesting the British authorities who they saw as heavily favoring the Zionists um, in, in Palestine. And, 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 um, and so, you know, they were protesting particularly Jewish immigration, which had started to balloon 
uh, in the 30s or in the onset of World War II. And you know, we also even have a panel here. Uh, um, I don't think you can see it properly, um, but it's, a, it's actually of a Jewish settlement of newly arrived Jewish immigrants from, from Europe. Um, and they actually settled in, in tents like this. Um, and then we, you know, this middle panel kind of goes into the partition plan and the white paper we also, and then we uh, finally go into, um, we have a series of images of Palestinians actually being forcibly uh, removed and settled into the refugee camps. Here is uh, a picture of the Jaramana refugee camp in Syria. Um, and we also have one here. This is, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> this is actually an image of, of Palestinians being marched away from their homes. Um, my, uh, my, my father and my grandparents, they probably took this exact same route when leaving. Um, in our second section, we kind of, we have, uh, as you know, the well, the Nakba created a, a whole litany of of icons and uh, and slogans that are familiar for us as Palestinians that keep us grounded. You know, one of the things that we wanted to show, uh, uh, and I'll just switch to the second gallery again. So this is section two, which kind of goes into the symbology of the Palestinian movement in, in general. Uh, but a lot of these came out of the Nakba. You know, of course, one of the central tenets of the Nakba is the desire to return, al-awda, ila Palestine. And we have in the key is a very critical symbol of this. So we have a few panels of, of Palestinians showing their keys. We actually do have a, uh, uh, a copy of a key, uh, well, actually an actual key that was donated to us. This is a key of a Palestinian you know, many Palestinians, when they were fleeing, they kept their keys in the hopes that they would be coming back or thinking that they would be coming back. And of course, that didn't happen. So the key remains a symbol, you know, this, this proof that we were here. We also have examples of some of the socio-political, the civic life passing after the Nakba. Palestinians became, you know, we didn't just sit idly while this happened to us. You know, we started to get active. Um, sometimes not in our best interests, <laughs> but we did, you know, we formed student groups, we formed feminist groups, we formed, uh, you know, just, we became very active on campuses, you know, my, uh, my mother told me that, you know, at AUB, there were, you know, hundreds of posters that the, 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 the Palestinian Student Association was so huge and influential. You know, uh, despite things being kind of difficult for Palestinians at the time, especially during the Lebanese Civil War. Um, but, you know, today, uh, Palestinians are all over the world, you know, despite the Nakba, despite this catastrophe that happened to us, we've been able to persevere. Um, there are 15 million Palestinians today around the world, and we're all over the place. I mean, I can speak personally. Uh, I have family in, in Denmark, in the Gulf, Canada, and the United States, just to name a few places, you know? Um, and it, yeah, it's sad that, you know, this was, we were, we had to, to move to these places. It was born out of a necessity to, to make something of ourselves, but we did, you know? I mean, I, I can be a testament to this, you know? I, I'm here, <laughs> I live in America, and, uh, you know, I, uh, thankfully, you know, I have a good career and I, I mean, you know, um, I didn't, I didn't want to, the, I didn't want something like this just to define me, you know, we actually at the museum, we have a map here, uh, that kind of goes into the Palestinian diaspora in more detail. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, it kind of gives you a breakdown of where Palestinians are today, you know, and one of the surprising things, uh, is Chile, for example, in South America, there's a lot of Palestinians living in Chile and they're one of the biggest, it's actually these largest uh, Palestinian diaspora community outside of the Arab world, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, we also have a, a tab here. Uh, this is an actually an interactive display of the map and we can kind of go through it and it'll give you more data 
and context uh, around the population. So highly encourage you. To, okay, uh, to, is it yeah. possible that you, uh, to go through the map and just show like the numbers and sure, talk about yeah. that more? Uh, especially yeah. that it's it's really important for people to understand that, like even even before the Nakba, <clears throat> there was immigration. <clears throat> yeah to other parts of the world, like Chile. But the, the Nakba has really created the biggest wave of, of displacement mm -hmm. for Palestinians. And, and as you see in this map, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an, it's, it'll take, uh, it's taking a, a few seconds, but it's... Um, um, but... So, you know, there's 15 million Palestinians in diaspora, uh, well, 15 million Palestinians worldwide, over 5 million that are actually living in the diaspora. Um, and this was actually put together by people, uh, volunteers at the museum itself. Um, uh, and so I think that this is a really great project. Mo, uh, apropos the, um, yeah. this map, someone just asked how the data is tracked. So if you could tell a little bit about what Amber and sure. um, I think yourself and Steve and all that you yeah. did to put this together. So the, the data is very spotty. Uh, it, it wasn't easy to, coll uh, to collect it, but I think most of the data came from the Center for Palestinian Studies. Uh, and then uh, I think also Amber reached out to uh, a few governments uh, to get clarity. So representative of governments or diaspora communities uh, or representatives uh, to, uh, oops. Um, so, the, so I think like that's how, but there was a, just a number of different sources. Um, uh, yeah, sorry here. I, well, actually this kind of talks about it too. Uh, so the Palestinian Center of Bureau of Statistics, uh, Badil and the Resource Center for Palestinian Residents and Refugee Rights um, and Anurwa too. Uh, but again, the data is spotty. It's not, um, you know, there are no, there's no accurate, uh, like foolproof accurate information about where, you know, particularly with communities like that are living in, in, in countries like Chile, most of the, most of the Palestinians there were economic migrants from, you know, the early, early parts of the 20th century, you know, the turn of the 20th century. And most of them have assimilated into Chilean life but they still hold on to their Palestinian roots. So, um, but you're definitely welcome to, ch to check it out. Uh, you know, it's, we've broken it out into different regions. So we're gonna focus on the Middle East and uh, Palestine is actually in Israel and Palestine. Um, and we also talk about the refugees as well, the actual refugees, the registered refugees. So I highly encourage you to check it out. Um, if you want to learn more about Palestinians who have actually made it in, in the world today, we have a, a section called Making Their Mark, and it kind of goes over, uh, it profiles a number of prominent Palestinians uh, around who, you know, made their mark on the world. Um, so, you know, there were no shortage of people that I could look up to growing up from Mahmoud Darwish, who was a very famous Palestinian poet, to Hassan Kanafani, um, to, uh, um, oh, um, you know, to people like Rashid Atleb today, you know, who was the first Palestinian member of Congress. So, um, so I highly also encourage you to, to check it out as well. So. Uh, Mo, there is a couple of questions uh, sure. about the resources and maybe I can add to that. Uh, so, <clears throat> so the resources uh, of the population uh, of Palestinians really, uh, as, as Mo said, it's tricky because there's what, what we found out that, that, for example, the Palestinian Authority uh, in Palestine had different numbers than, for example, the community in Chile. The Center for Palestine Studies, which is, someone asked about it, uh, which is a center based in DC and Lebanon. Uh, they're working on uh, a lot of uh, scholarly scholars and, and working with a lot of data. 
uh, they had also different numbers. So what we, we had, it, it, this is a project that lasted for like six months. And so we did actually collect all the data and um, the data that you see on the museum, it's, it's as, as much accurate as we found as mm -hmm. possible. You know, there yeah. were different resources. Uh, there is, uh, we, we believe that what uh, the Palestinian Authority in Palestine, they, had a big, they have a big center and they also have the most accurate numbers. Uh, and so we believe that I think uh, their numbers were, were the most were the most accurate. Again, you know there might be some uh, some little bit inaccuracy, but I think these are uh, uh, 90, 90, let's say ninety five percent the numbers accurate. accurate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it's. Uh, I think the map. I mean, you know, beyond the the figure in the city, it just shows the the. The dispersion, you know, the the Palestinians are all literally we're all over the world, you know, and it's just it, it truly is the definition of a global community, and so you know my message to the naysayers is you know we need to look at the positive, we need to look, we need to be able to move forward as a people and 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 chart our path, you know, and that's kind of why I love launching in the museum because we try to show this positive we, we try to uh, show Palestine and Palestinians within the context of our own we're not within you know uh, as, as, a, as a, an antagonism to Zionism or as an antagonism to Israel you know of course that's a big part of our identity you know because this this was an injustice that was committed against us but we shouldn't at the same time I feel let it define us in that way yes. so but yeah, I think that's, you know, pretty much, um, you know, thank you for letting me share. I, you know, I'm definitely open to taking questions. So if there are any more questions, I'd love to hear them or you can ask me anything. Mo, well, there was a question in the chat. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the National Geographic magazine article we have? Sure, yes. Um, so the, uh, the title of the article is Village Life in the Holy Land. And it's basically, uh, it was uh, written, you know, in 1914, and and the the target audience, so um, the target audience were Americans who were interested in the Near East. So as you know, in the in the early part of the 20th century, there was a massive, like a surging interest in Orientalism uh, or the fascination with the Near East, and one of them was, of course, Palestine, uh, particularly, you know, the focus on on uh, Palestine within the context of, of the Holy Land and the Bible, you know, Old Testament revivalism, they call it. This was a very big part of the interest in, in, in Palestine in particular. Uh, so the article itself, and forgive me, it is a little um, slow because I'm sharing my screen as well. Um, so the article kind of goes into, into, into emphasizing that. Um, the images of Palestinians are Kind of like you know they tried they really tried to to capture past as if they were like coming straight out of the Bible you know straight out of those times um, which is what I found that uh, for me that was a little problematic you know because my experience of Palestine is not necessarily I mean you know village life or Falahian life is is important uh, it's a big part of our identity but we're also you know uh, you know, we had urban centers, we had uh, commerce, we had trade, we were, you know, we had big cities uh, like Haifa and, and Jaffa and, and Khalil, Hebron. Um, and so, but of course, the emphasis of foreign Americans was to, to, you know, this, this article tried to kind of, you know, it was part of a whole body of literature that kind of tried to paint this this empty land, you know, which also plays nicely into the Zionist narrative, you know, that they came in and... Uh, um, well, but, uh, yeah. I think also the, the, the contrary that the museum is showing, like, I, like it's, it, it's, yes, it does show that, uh, that Palestinians were villages, but also we're showing two different uh, stories so, yeah, through the museums that one is, is look at this like from a Western perspective, showing Palestinians as farmers, but also from a Palestinian perspective, which a museum is showing us, is that Palestinians had a good civilization, and there mm -hmm. is 
several examples you know you can talk about in uh, yeah i did talk about the you know the, yeah. the this image here mm. uh, and we have an, a couple of others which haven't been tool tipped yet but uh, we're working on that uh the image above it and you probably can't see it i mean, let me see if i can zoom in um, yeah that's yeah. an important yeah yeah um, but this one actually shows uh, a, it's an image of women, uh, of Palestinian women uh, doing uh, platries, you know, and this was part of the Palestinian Women's Union. So we had feminist movements as well. Even the, you know, leading up to 1948, you know, uh, Palestinians were very mobilized and, and politically. It's just, you know, it just wasn't in our, <laughs> in our cards as my, as <laughs> as my father uh, always used to say, but, um, but yeah. Mo, I have a question about um, sure. skulls. So one of my favorite um, sections of the museum are the identity cards and the marriage yeah. certificates. What symbols did your family keep, um, whether it's mm. certificates or keys or, or something else um, as they were displaced? Yeah. Um, so we definitely, um, I mean, my grandfather kept the deed to his house as proof, and he also kept the keys. So those were important. As refugees, for me, I really, you know, even after getting my citizenship and uh, my American citizenship, I, I held on, I still hold on to my, uh, my, my, my Palestinian identity card. So all Palestinians are issued an identity card. And I also held on to my birth certificates as well. So um, these are few proofs because, you know, as soon as you become a, a citizen of any other country, everyone is just really quick to want to deny you of your Palestinian identity. Like there's no, there's nothing formal, you know, uh, that said I was, you know, I was Palestinian. My, my U.S. passport says I was born in, in Lebanon. So for all intents and purposes, I could have just been Lebanese. But then when I go back to Lebanon, uh, they're like, why don't you have a Lebanese passport? <laughs> so of course, I, I mean, so part of it was like I needed to hang on to these, uh, onto this proof. But it's, um, but yeah. And, and I think, and I think this, this, uh, I don't know if people can see. I think this, this identity is is really the most the hardest part about being Palestinian because it really. Uh, prohibit us from the, the movement, like from mm -hmm. the freedom of movement around the world. For example, uh, I have a Palestinian ID that was issued by the Palestinian Authority slash uh, the Israeli government in, from the West Bank, right? So, uh, so my ID is, is, is difficult, like as a Palestinian, with this ID, I can go back to Palestine, specifically the West Bank and Bethlehem and live there, right? Uh, for example, Mo doesn't have this kind of ID, so he cannot go and live in, in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Palestine or the West Bank. Uh, another distinction, I have the Palestinian ID, but I don't have the Jerusalem ID or the Israeli ID, which, which is, so I can't go and live in Israel. I can't go live in Jerusalem, right, where I was, mm -hmm. where I was born. Uh, another distinction that I don't have the ID from Gaza, which I can go and live in Gaza. So there is all these, you know, separations and fragmentation of Palestinian identity that deliberately is is put in place uh, by the Israeli government to to keep yeah. Palestinians divided. I mean, it's it, yeah. uh, and it's really an important factor of of the doc, you know, like being mm -hmm. Palestinian and the documents that we have. Yeah. Uh, one interesting, so we didn't have, um, well, one interesting thing, we had a, an, uh, one of my favorite paintings in our art exhibit um, was a, uh, it was a, a world map, but um, the actual, uh, the actual landmass was cut out of, uh, it was a world map made of shredded passport pages with stamps, visa stamps. Um, you know, that said access denied. It was a, it was a wathika, like a, a Palestinian a refugee issued document. One that I used to have, you know, and I remember like growing up, I mean, even uh, when we were living in the Gulf in the mid nineties, there was a time when they, uh, one summer, I remember we wanted to go back to Lebanon and they were like, no, you need visas to go back to Lebanon. 
that was soul crushing that, you know, it's like I was born there and, you know, why do I need to a visa to go back to the place that I was born in? Like, what do you, you know, so it was, it was incredulous um, um, to me that th this would happen. Uh, but yeah, ideas, you know, it's like a blessing and a curse. It, it solidifies, it, it solidifies our, our, uh, our identity as Palestinians, but it also means that our movement is restricted. And uh, yeah. So in a few minutes, we're gonna open um, the floor to questions. So if you have questions that you wanna ask Mo directly, I'll unmute everybody so you can ask your questions. But I have one more question from someone who can't unmute. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you could quickly address, how long did Palestinians have to leave their homes? Um, you know, I don't know. I, it could probably varied, you know, but it wasn't very long. You know, we're, we're talking hours, <laughs> you know, they, from, from the edict to when, you know, because when my, uh, they literally took what they could carry on their backs um, before fleeing. And when my, um, yeah. I think, I think, uh, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I'm not sure who asked. Uh, I think this also would be a great question to ask Hassan, who mm -hmm. is also a Nakba survivor, who spoke yesterday with us. Yeah. And we will bring him back to do a series of episodes in the next week. So um, stay, stay tuned. I think, I think that's, that's a good... Uh, I, for, for my knowledge, I know it's a few hours. I know like some like Palestinians knew about what's, what, what's happening and... Uh, when things intensified, they, they had to leave. Uh, but I think that would be good to hear it from Hassan, who's, who's himself uh, uh, free Jaffa or mm -hmm. Jaffa. Yeah. Um. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and unmute everyone. We have two questions in the chat that I'm hoping um, will be asked directly from Kent and Nadine. So let me go ahead and give you one second to... I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, so everyone should be free to ask your questions. So Kent, Nadine, one of you want to start? Uh, hi, um, our question was two things. One, we were just asking about representation in the museum. Well, first of all, thank you everyone for sharing your story. It was amazing to hear and we really enjoyed it. Um, and we were wondering about how is BDS represented in the museum, if it is at all? And you know, you know the impact that it's had on Palestinian And additionally, I know you talked about the symbolism of keys for the Palestinian right of return. Um, mm -hmm. And we're wondering how else that's represented, especially as generations pass um, and new generations are born that may not have that same symbolism of having the keys or the documents, but that still feel that attachment to Palestine. Is there that representation as well? Um, excellent, excellent questions. Um, so the first part, so we don't actually have a BDS exhibit at the museum, uh, but we do have, I mean, we do have a, a, an image of Handala, who is like, I think the official icon of the BDS movement. Um, and we, we do talk, I mean, we, we do go into great lengths about the occupation itself and the, 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 the hardships that Palestinians have endured uh, under the occupation itself. Um, so, yeah, but we don't actually officially have, you know, and in terms of the, your second part, your second question about the symbology, I mean, there's, you know, there's the map of Palestine that has become a very strong symbol, you know, uh, the, and, and, uh, the flag, the Kofi is also remains a pretty modern symbol. I know it's been culturally appropriated, uh, in many ways that I don't really like, but, um, it still remains a powerful symbol, you know. You know. But I mean, in my opinion, as a Palestinian, I mean, the way to focus, you know, to 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 maintain this is to do well, to to persevere, <laughs> to get educated, to be successful, to show the world that we are here, and that we are meaningful contributors. You know, our enemies, our our protagonists, our our antagonists they believe the complete opposites, you know? 
And uh, um, I, you know, it's like part of my mission is to prove them wrong. You know, I like studied English. I, you know, I, I just wanted to, to, to show the world, you know. So anyway, sorry, I'm like going into that, but that's, that's my advice. I was wondering what your school was like before you had to actually go walk that long distance from the camp. Did you actually have um, any schooling in the camp also that you remember? Oh, no, that's my father. Um, so my father went to Anurwa school, yeah. Um, yeah, I actually, my life, completely privileged compared to what my parents went through. Uh, sorry, my father went through. I was not born in a refugee camp. I was born in Beirut, you know. I mean, life was difficult, uh, you know, because the war. It's kind of painful, <laughs> but yeah, so um, uh, I, I went to, uh, I just, I went to a school called Ataya. It was a small school. And then, um, and then in Qatar, I went to an English school, an international school which is why my English is good, <laughs> which is why people, I get this question all the time. Why is your English so good? And I say, because I actually went to an international school in the Gulf. So, um, Someone's okay. saying that uh, there is a book talking about the road to Naples. Yeah. Uh, but Sam had, yeah, yeah. His father had five minutes to leave their, their home in, in uh, Lids, I think that's in Arabic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what's crazy to me um, is that my, you know, they were allowed to, you know, after the, uh, after 1948, they, you know, they stayed for an additional year and they were only the, kicked out in 1949, you know, which is like such a burn, <laughs> you know, that my life could have been very different had, you know, that general in one flick of a, a decision said, you know, we don't, we're not gonna depopulate this village. We're just gonna keep them here. You know, my life could have been very different, so. Um, I had a question. Um, my name is Elizabeth. Hi, thanks for your, your story. Yeah. Um, so you said that your yeah. grandfather kept the deed to his, uh, to his house in the village in, in Palestine. I'm wondering, uh, was the deed issued, who was the deed issued by? And, and the same with uh, Pshara's family, if you have, um, I'm sure you do obviously have a, a deed to your house. And does it, does it matter uh, whether it was uh, who the deed was issued by in terms of getting your rights back? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so my father, um, sorry, my grandfather had the deed and it was issued by the British mandate. Um, and yeah, so you would think that they would not be absentee, but because, because the Arab Legion far, uh, army actively defended the village, they were considered co um, collateral oh. war. And so they were given a different status you know, that they were hostile. Um, and so they were, they left, uh, they were, uh, sorry, removed. Well, uh, so. Sorry, what was the question to me, uh, Elizabeth? Um, so since I know that your family is from, from Bethlehem and the, and the farm yeah. there and that it's currently, um, you know, being contested by the Israeli government, they want to, they want to take it, as you said earlier. Yeah. Um, I was wondering who the, who has signed your deed to your family's land, and if that makes it any different than than Muhammad's family's story um, in terms of your rights and how you can can keep your your land? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think one of the uh, the, the differences between um, most story and and my family's story is that his family is from the north of of Palestine, which is now in in Israel. So because this is where uh, the Haganah uh, gangs and all the, the militias, the Israeli militias uh, in 1948 were concentrated and they were, uh, you know, uh, looting and, and displacing people from their homes. Uh, however, my family is from the West Bank. So that, is, so the Israelis 
did not get to the West Bank until until 1967 mm -hmm. uh, because the West Bank was under uh, the Jordanians. Um, yeah, and so so the deed from the family, the farm where my family was came from the Ottoman Empire. So this is where uh, my great grandfather was. Um, he bought this land and one of the things that he did he actually uh, he he got papers you know back back then in 1916 and in, in the last century people were, were exchanging and buying lands without papers and he was so he was smart to to get uh, papers and he was smart to pay taxes on the on the on the farm and so that was that was very uh, credible from the Ottoman back from the Ottoman and then uh, from the British uh, who were there and then from the Jordanians. So um, uh, and that's you know one of the reasons that they 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 had I mean my family has has it approved but also uh, like there is a lot of international support. For the farm at this point, that it, it's it's hard to to uh, to, to take it. Uh, I, I mean, hopefully not. It's it's a very a tricky situation with the courts. Thank you both. You're welcome. Question from Lisa, is it or? Yes, um, Bashara talking about what's maybe going to happen in a couple of months time with annexation. Um, could you speak to how that could affect the Tent of Nations, your family farm? Uh, with, the, with the annexation? Yes. Uh, I, I actually don't, I'm not sure which annexation, are you talking about this? Uh, I'm not following, to be honest, what's the next uh, the um, plans for the go government to to do right. so I, I i don't have much information on on that but i know i know that uh there's uh, uh, there is always continued harassment and continues to confiscating lands and building more settlements so that's something that has been continued from 1948 uh, and you know, continued harassment to Palestinians to leave their homes, and and back in my family, in my family case, like continued uh, harassment and and uh, making things difficult since 1991, uh, to especially with the courts and with with uprooting trees. Uh, however, I I don't know what's what's the next plans right now. I am not following on what's exactly the new annexation plans that's going to happen. Yeah. Well, I don't think anyone actually knows for sure, but they're talking about all of Area C, and I think that would be where your farm is. Um, they're talking maybe just the Israeli settlements and the Jordan Valley. So until there's more known, um, yeah, you know, yeah. there isn't any more known at this point. Yeah. But I, I have great concern about if they try to go after all of Area C, that that mm -hmm. would impact your farm. Yes, I, I definitely. I think, of course, it does impact. I mean, Area C is already under the full military Israeli control, yeah. so mm -hmm. it's um, it's a tricky situation, and then it's it's, uh, it's hard to see what's what's going to happen next. A friend of mine was uh, telling me, he's like, Israel's not an apartheid state, but in Area C, they are an apartheid state. I'm like, oh, thanks for the distinction. <laughs> Is there any questions from, from uh, before we close? I do have a question, if you can hear me. Sure. Okay. Is the Likud party still part of, um, of an Israeli terrorist group? They are an official political party in Israel. They're like the Republican Party. Yeah. Right, but do I know? Well, I think the gentleman that talk, spoke yesterday said something about the terrorist group, and I can't pronounce the name. Um, became part of the the Likud party. Became part of the terrorist group. That 
that was that was the the the, the groups the militias that they, they were considered the terrorist group back then yeah by the british that's what he meant they okay. were considered by the british okay. they, they went the on to part right them. now is an official part of the government of the Israeli yeah, government. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted But to yes, I mean, to... yeah, no, there are, there are the leaders, the leaders are probably like some, some are similar, some are, are um, uh, some of the same leaders who were at these militias became uh, prime ministers, became high ranking officers right. in the army later okay. on. Okay. All right, thank that you. Helps. And I do have yeah. another question about the Palestinian flag. I was told years ago that the Palestinian yeah so flag so yeah and and yeah and someone in the chat actually that was me mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead go ahead if you can answer that question um, do you have the question in front of you uh, I I couldn't hear the question more can you okay. answer I I couldn't the the Palestinian flag, I heard that the original Palestinian flag, originally the mm. top part of it where the black is today was green and the bottom part was um, black. And the reason they said it was like black now and green um, on the bottom is because of the war and until Palestine becomes a state again, will it change back? Is that true? I, I never heard of that before, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. I heard that a long time ago. I, I wanted to clarify that because I wasn't sure I, if it was or not. Um, I, I, don't, tell, I don't Could you think. explain the meaning of the colors or what, what, what each color means, if you know? I mean, and basically, uh, they're, 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 they're the, they were the, these colors are actually adopted by the Pan-Arab movement. Um, Specifically, I think even under um, like Lawrence of Arabia during World War One, you know, the British kind of were like, here, some colors. <laughs> and so, you know, the flag is and all many of the Arab uh, flags in the Arab, Arab world have these three colors. And uh, they, you know, they, they just correspond to different parts of the Muslim empire. Like the red section is the Khawarji movement and the black stripe stands for the, the Rashidun Caliphate, uh, and the white, I think, is the Umayyads. What's green? I think the Fatimid. So it's not like clear cut. They're like different. Um, this is the, the, you know, they just uh, each color represents a, a different part. So of someone the, just posted oh, the link yeah. on um, colors of the Arab award meaning at simples. Yeah. So you can you can. Uh, you can check that link, uh, Delal. Okay, thank you. Yeah, You're thank you so much for for your your time. Uh, I think we're just it's about uh, twelve fifteen. We're going to yeah. close this meeting. Um, again, thank you, Mo. And if you would like thank to you. to dive into more the museum and the artifacts and the details, uh, you can go on our virtual museum uh, right now. The museum is closed and we hope to, to open uh, back uh, sometime in June. We'll see it's, it's uh, up to the DC government. They're closed until June 8th. Uh, and I think there's several stages where uh, different organizations and businesses are going to be open in, in, the, in the area. Um, and you know, if you usually if you come on a Saturday like this, we we usually welcome you with an open arms and a tea, a Palestinian tea. And so we hope that one day, you know, uh, soon that uh, this crisis will will end or will 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 go down a little bit, and we'll able to open the museum again and welcome you back with tea. Yeah. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, thank you for your support. And, you know, we, we actually are doing these programs and continue to do all of these activities and maintain the museum with, with your support. So if you, if you uh, are able and uh, can, please make a donation to the museum, whether it's one-time donation or monthly donation to help us sustain our operations uh, as, we, as we move forward to, to the unknown uh, 
uh, you know, unknown future, you know, that mm -hmm. we're, we're dealing with at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you again for your time. And uh, just one last announcement. Next Friday, um, stay tuned. We have an artist from Palestine. He's going to be speaking about the coronavirus in Palestine uh, and his artwork. So it's going to be very interesting. And the following week, we will have uh, also a virtual concert. concert that's going to be with um, Noel Kharman. She's a Palestinian singer from Haifa. She's very famous. Uh, she has about 200,000 followers on Facebook. So check her out. Uh, she also sings in English and Arabic. So stay tuned. We're going to have uh, a concert uh, at the end of uh, May, May, May 30th. Uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, hope you have a wonderful day and a great Thank week. you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you for joining, Carol.